Thanks everyone for getting up this freezing morning and um, coming, to, coming here to listen. Uh, live isn't really my medium, so I find this sculpture the perfect way to hide. <laughs> and probably, uh, and I hope you can enjoy the pictures and uh, not my fidgeting with these papers. So we're good, yeah? Yes. Um, so uh, how I got here today started with uh, a coffee table. Uh, or the lack of one, to be precise. Uh, a couple of winter weeks, two years ago, I wandered about in, in, in furniture stores here in Stockholm, trying to figure out which new one to buy. See, I wasn't going to buy one at Ikea, I thought. N not this time. Uh, this might, might seem like a petty decision, but for me it symbolized some strange transition into adulthood. Being able to spend my earned money on something nice and maybe something expensive even. And uh, after some heavy thinking on this very uh, superficial matter, uh, I reached my decision. And I was going for a basic concrete table, uh, which was super basic, but also a bit pricey. Uh, and I have a hard time uh, making decisions, so for me this was a big thing. <laughs> and uh, I went back to the store in which I'd seen the table uh, to inform them of the happy news. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but this joy of finding the table, uh, finally, was quickly shattered when they announced there was a, a waiting list to be uh, included amongst the future owners of this uh, table and its clones. And the waiting time was eight weeks. Uh, so I don't know about you, but for me eight weeks is an eternity. And this was not the news I wanted to hear. So I reconsidered my decision. Walking back home, I sort of rekindled my love for IKEA and the whole no fuss IKEA experience because at least at IKEA, you know, you always get something back with you home from the department store. Uh, my grumpy mood had another setback when I slipped on the hard January sidewalk, only to sort of crash into a pile of building debris um, and to continue sliding, uh, hit, finally hitting the back of my head in the sidewalk, which was not very nice. So uh, I got up with my head still spinning from the fall uh, and uh, cursing this vicious pile. Um, but I found myself staring at it. And I remember it to be a couple of these orange big bags. And they were slightly covered in snow. And uh, next to them were a couple of these uh, wooden shipping pallets. What happened here? Okay, so. uh, and. Uh, uh, it was like this pile stared back at me, asking for forgiveness, saying, this is your table right here. Uh, you, you. And they come and it's not. And so, uh, and so uh, a minute later, I find myself uh, carrying uh, one um, of these wooden shipping pallets under each of my skinny, not very muscular arms. This was in Kala Vägen, this is a January Sunday uh, afternoon. And uh, so, uh, when I got home, I realized, and uh, yeah, and I, this was, I mean, the pallet shipping tables was not my idea. I've seen tons of them in magazines, and I've seen one of them in one of the stores I'd been earlier that day. But they wanted uh, tw 12 to some for theirs. And I figured mine would be a hell of a lot cheaper. Uh, so, with these new pallets in my living room, uh, <laughs> to my boyfriend's surprise, <laughs> uh, I didn't exactly know how to go about making these to a table, but I've seen the table in the store. It didn't seem too complicated. It was a couple of wheels, basically, and some paint. And I'd seen some boxes with the power tools in the back of a closet in my boyfriend's apartment. Uh, <laughs> so I figured I could borrow those. <laughs> um, but the fact was, I hadn't worked with uh, wood or anything practical like this since basically woodworking class and making these uh, smörknivar, which we all remember. <laughs> Uh, but I gave uh, the power tools a go, and turns out it wasn't all that co complicated. Um, and 
just this basic thing of uh, holding a screwdriver um, was this uh, great breakthrough for me. And as I felt sort of the, the uh, drill pierce the wood, I also felt uh, this bubble of practical confidence burst inside of me. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, the table wasn't very pretty and it was very impractical. As you see, I kept the slots. Uh, so you couldn't put like glasses or something, stuff like that on. <laughs> it was very impractical. Uh, but uh, I remember putting my legs up on it for the first time and feeling uh, how awesome it was and how awesome I was having made it by myself. And from that moment on, uh, I knew that I want more of this. So uh, in the period that followed uh, this first build, uh, I uh, put up most of my old furniture on Blockget. And uh, so this cleared a lot of space and gave me some extra cash. Um, it also gave me sort of the physical space to develop new ideas. And uh, made me um, sort of uh, challenge my conception about what home was and who I was. And in the coming months, a lot of new stuff popped up, like a kitchen sofa, a dining table, and uh, a new double bed for my guest room. Um, so the coffee table experience had been uh, this uh, sort of, had unleashed a storm of creative energy. Uh, suddenly I found opportunity waiting for me on every street corner, literally. And this was a bit overwhelming. Rather saw scrap, I saw, uh, upside down table bases and uh, yeah my place was a total mess <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, walking around the city I, I saw all these um, I had I had a rewired I got a new set of associations because I I I knew now that you could turn this sort of scrappy things into cool stuff and uh, uh, when I walked around I saw uh, like a chair in this one it was just I think close to slotted and uh, this was in Berlin, I was like, this looks like a desk. And this looked like an upside down table base. So you could just put some stuff, some planks or something, turn it around and they, you could have a nice table. Uh, so uh, I was also increasingly inspired by the design I saw around me and sort of making the connections between all this sort of scrappy raw material that I found lying in the street. I found I developed a kind of design thinking um, I became sort of allergic to fancy, expensive design, as I believe these sort of clever design ideas could be so much more useful if the design blueprints could be more openly shared. And this sort of thinking made me reverse engineer a lot of the design I saw in stores and in shops. And I tried to create some of these blueprints uh, uh, by myself. Uh, and I wanted myself to snap out of this admiration, passive admiration of design and get more into this kind of thinking because I felt uh, the energy it released inside of me. So uh, just walking around, I take a lot of photos. So uh, I tend to snap things that I find interesting. So this was just a piece of scrap I saw on the street in Malmö. And the other day after I saw this piece of uh, uh, interior design in a fun hundred store in Copenhagen and if you see these are pretty similar shapes so I felt ah, I got a, got a good hunch and um, these were some these old building things <laughs> I saw in in Berlin in Torstrasse or what, you, what it's called like a hips place and then just going into a store around the corner I saw this so this opened my eyes to the potential in all these raw materials. This was also something I saw, and which was very similar to a, a chair I saw in New York, which was basically this one with, with some strings and some of the furry stuff. Um, and also here in Stockholm, I became aware of these kind of things. That these are the sort of blocks that keep up the um, signs uh, for in traffic. And then this, you might remember from outside of Scandic. And you see that they have the same kind of blocks. So I started walking around like this, analyzing stuff. Here's another example of the uh, police uh, in New York's, their sort of barricade stuff. 
which I found that people had made restaurant furniture from. Yeah, so parallel to this practical creative process, I kept my mind busy trying to come up with some theoretical concept to excuse this seemingly irrational behavior for someone who had spent eight years at university. Eventually I came up with the concept of scrap hacking, making me a scrap hacker and my project Scrap Hacks. Uh, labeling the process was a way for me to connect to something bigger than myself. And I remember checking the web host Lupia's webpage to see if the domain scraphacker.com was taken. It wasn't. I remember googling scraphacker only to find zero results. I found this really fascinating. <laughs> um, and it made me want to uh, explore, explain and develop this concept, which I found filled uh, an important gap. Um, so for me, scrap hacking wasn't about uh, just making cool stuff out of old palettes. It was a channeling this sort of hacky creative outlook onto a lot of uh, resources that I saw uh, sort of wasted and overseen around me. I came to realize also that not only was scrap hacking fun, but it was also a very sustainable approach to design. As you could source the, the scrap locally, sort of on your street corner, and you can source ideas globally through your computer. So this was sort of a collaborative design venture from all around the world, but you can sort of produce it locally, which was very much in tune with how we like to think today. So uh, as the uh, domain name wasn't taken, in Lupia I, I bought it for 79 <laughs> kroner. Uh, and setting up the blog was a learning by doing process. I had not, hadn't blogged before. And I set up a WordPress blog, which I can recommend because it's super easy. Uh, and so uh, setting up the blog was a learning by doing experience. And I had to learn a bit of code uh, and some graphic design. And, uh, I had to develop my uh, ability to write, which is not my strong suit. Um, I was happy to find this sort of digital canvas for self-expression, uh, because I guess this uh, some sort of uh, uh, need for creative output <laughs> had been piling up inside of me for quite some time. I didn't tell about pe uh, people I knew about this project for uh, quite some time. And uh, this, uh, in retrospect, I can see this was a risk-reducing strategy and uh, a strategy that I can recommend. Um, because uh, I, I, w I felt really happy in getting rid of these shackles of Facebook self-consciousness and, uh, and sort of very free and not having to know exactly where the project was going, taking pressure off. And uh, I felt this project had to be about me going on a creative road trip um, and I felt the freedom in this road trip the kind of way you do when you're exp out exploring a big new city all by yourself. So, uh, as you saw earlier, during my hacking processes, I take a lot of photographs. And this enabled me to write, to fill up the blog initially with my first posts, rich richly illustrated and a bit uh, boring because I, they would, could be like never ending. <laughs> with like 40 pictures in how to make uh, a table. And uh, I figured out that this formula wasn't really what people wanted. Um, and so I, um, and setting up my own blog, I, I became acquainted with this whole do-it-yourself blogosphere. And it was quickly uh, clear to me that I was nowhere near as talented as the pros out there making sort of crazy cool stuff. But I was very curious and eager to learn and sort of dive into this pool of do-it-yourself discovery. Is it working? Yeah, like that. So now I have to look at a bit in my papers. Um, so uh, trying to find the, this voice or format in a blog uh, and consistency isn't too easy. Especially if you, uh, uh, like me, are a visual rather than a verbal person. Uh, but I knew how to focus my sprawling mind on something uh, um, a theme, basically, and kill off a lot of darlings, because initially I could write about scrap hacker businesses like fry tag bags or like Patagonia. And this was like me being all over the place and trying to dress this blog up in a serious suit. But uh, after a while I gained some confidence in this field and I could just focus on the fun stuff, which for me was about the pictures. Um, 
finding and gaining my own practical confidence in this first build and seeing all the uh, awesome processes it sparked inside of me convinced me of the importance of getting more people over the do-it-yourself threshold. So I wanted my blog to be very motivational and not only inspirational because I find that we're swamped with these inspirational photos everywhere today in interior design magazines and stuff like that. But they're very rarely motivational and they're only showing sort of a picture of the finished result and telling some story about some amazing person who made this stuff. So uh, motivational pictures is about showing action and showing a hand painting something because then you really feel that you can make it too. And uh, I channeled my own impatience into this format uh, because I don't have the patience to see like 100 pictures in one blog post. So I made these pictorials, or, or I, I call them that, because they're sort of a mashup between pictures and tutorials and just trying to make uh, the visual imagery like very compact and direct and motivational. And uh, let's see what. Next slide is, I have no idea. Yeah, and uh, I started a Facebook page about a year ago. Uh, this was a good step because by then I had uh, quit my job and started my own freelancing web design, uh, little, one, one person <laughs> company. And sitting alone working all day can, be, uh, can take its toll on your motivation. So uh, in reaching out to fa through Facebook, I made uh, and to sort of the first hundreds of people, I sort of found a new boss. And uh, as you don't want to disappoint your boss, I didn't want to in, uh, disappoint them. And as I still felt like Bambi on thin ice, I still uh, didn't tell any of my friends about this because I felt it would be like shitting where I ate. Uh, and I embraced this anonymity. After all, I wanted Scrapbacker to be about awesome ideas and not about me. And I think this is a common blogger's mistake that you, I mean, putting your name onto something can be an awesome thing, but it can also wear out a bit faster and it can also sort of add on a lot of social pressure in succeeding. And uh, working with Facebook was also very much a learning by doing experience. Uh, I had a hard time finding the words because I like pictures and not words. I suck at copywriting. And uh, I tried to sort of find the words to, to um, to sort of um, express my joy in finding these cool ideas online and uh, capture the visual poetry I saw in these pictures. And so I ended up uh, turning to the best, which was like this pool of inspirational quotes that are all over the internet in these various um, quote databases. And I found they were a good combination with sort of pictures like these. So actually a big part of uh, in meeting the Facebook presence is also finding these quotes to go with each of these themes that I come up with. So by pairing the pictures with these words, I felt I struck a chord. Because the pictures were all about crowdsourcing creativity from different parts of the world and sort of bridging uh, these, uh, s bridges these sort of spans in space. Like, Maybe this floor is in Australia, maybe the other floor is in Spain or whatever. And mixing them and remixing them with these quotes, I felt I sort of had this crowdsourced wisdom from history. And I hope that this combination could be, uh, uh, I, by combining these for forceful inputs, I wanted to create something very uh, encouraging and motivational. And these kinds of things were the stuff that grew my blog because they were likable and shareable. So this is the stats for October. Actually, uh, it's looking like I'm going to have 800,000 page views. And uh, I remember me saying I had there were zero results for Scrapbacker on Google. Well, now there are 179,000 of them. And this is obviously due to the growth of Pinterest and other of these sites, which have sort of increased the importance of, um, of imagery and make uh, good images spread like this. And so some takeaways. 
me reconnecting with my own long lost creativity that I hadn't felt since woodworking class uh, made me develop a, a new outlook in fully realizing that if I can think something, I can make it too. Uh, this was an important realization. And I renounced my vision of adulthood being this fancy sofa table and embraced a new, more fulfilling vision about what I wanted for myself. And this vision was, uh, as I tried to explain, was practical, creative and conscious and uh, as with a sprinkling of sustainability, which is never wrong. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of craft and do-it-yourself imagery circulating right now. And uh, the growth of my blog has nothing to do with sort of the blog being very, very awesome. It's more, I think, about the uh, current surge for do-it-yourself. Uh, it seems to strike a chord in the contemporary psyche, uh, probably because we're feeling we're stuck in our flat digital screens and that we sort of want to go out there in reality and do something. So in a way, do-it-yourself might be some kind of new porn, <laughs> but, but uh, it also seems very addictive, but uh, I also hope that people not only get stuck in sort of the image of do-it-yourself, but also into get into the practical stuff and actually doing something uh, out in real life. Um, and it's most definitely a sort of post-capitalist, post-academic movement. And don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist, <laughs> but I can still see there's something flawed in how we fill our lives with meaning. And that there are not that many processes that don't involve us buying new stuff to, fill, uh, to get this meaning. Uh, so do-it-yourself isn't all about knitting and carpenting and all these back-to-basics kind of crafts. It's about uh, uh, surprise, discovery, and sort of amazement of uh, human brilliance. Uh, and realizing also that small hacks can be the gateways of bigger ones, such as starting your own company, like I did, just a couple of months after building this first table. And it had probably never occurred to me before. Uh, but keeping that sort of design um, spirit alive and kicking requires reminders. And that's where the global community comes into the picture. So my vision of creativity today is all about this design diversity, about a collaborative group effort. And sort of there's no need to reinvent the wheel when there are so many good blueprints out there that are shared uh, on how to make your own cool stuff. And uh, my attempt to promote design diversity has been in developing this own digital mashup of uh, images and, uh, and words and be a matchmaker between local material and global creativity. And being convinced that visual information is motivational, uh, I've done my best in turning these ideas into sort of an accessible uh, bag of eye candy. And with uh, these uh, platforms, digital canvases of self-expression now available to all, um, we're seeing this democratization of, um, of creativity, which was what I wanted to say with this slide, basically. <laughs> uh, and anyone can be a designer today. And before and still today, we're, we, we've always idolized the chosen few as sort of token creatives. Uh, whereas I think that we all have that spark inside of us, instead of just consuming creativity through these creative geniuses. So I think it's super important that we tap into this design thinking within ourselves. Uh, I hope that we can become better in cherishing ideas over people and uh, allow everyone and anyone to tap into this uh, magic world of making. And I hope that we can uh, all <laughs> do our best to try uh, to fill our digital and our real worlds with some of this design diversity. So uh, looking back at that January, <laughs> slippery January Sunday afternoon, uh, I hope that my story has told you a little something about uh, the importance of not knowing, always knowing where you're going. Thank you. <laughs>